the same he holds a map of its trails in its mind, so that in emergencies it can cut corners that dies the cover. Even a brush with death doesn't put a sentry off its food. Like all small insect hunters, it needs to constantly fuel its internal fires. That is especially important when they're young to feed. Incredibly, this sangi is only a few hours old. Few mammals are born as well developed as a baby sangi, and this gives them a crucial survival edge. Daytime in the African bush is no place for the helpless. Sangis are born to run. Its appetite for milk is unquenchable. For growing at this speed gives it constant hunger. Its mother has nipples near her shoulders, which makes them easier to reach and presumably helps a quick getaway. The baby will take solid food from its mother on its very first day if it gets a chance. With continued help from its mother, the youngster will be almost fully grown within a week and be able to run as fast as her along their racetracks. insects one by one takes a lot of time and a lot of energy and very few creatures that feed that way can get enough to build and sustain big bodies. But some insect eaters early in their history about 40 million years ago solved that problem by broadening their diet and one of their descendants lives right here in my garden in London and I can tempt it out with a wide variety of food including for example minced meat. The hedgehog is still very much a creature of the night, but it's too big to hide in the leaf litter. That makes it vulnerable to attack from animals like foxes. To make up for this, its hairs have become a cloak of prickles. And if it thinks it's in real danger, it's got a special trick. The hedgehog will stay an impregnable spiny ball like this until it decides that danger has passed. But one thing is guaranteed to make a male hedgehog drop his guard, the promise of an amorous liaison. If you're outside on a spring evening, you may be lucky enough to witness an extraordinary sight. <laughs>
Whether the female flattens her prickles to help the male is unclear, but it does seem that the old joke that asks how do hedgehogs meet was right all along. The answer is, of course, with great care. The early American insect eaters also needed to protect themselves, but they did so not with spines, but with armor plating. Armadillos, like hedgehogs, grew large by broadening their diet. Their tastes change with the seasons. Fruit is easy to collect, but the nine-banded armadillo is not very fastidious and will pick up anything that looks edible. It still eats insects, but ants present it with a problem. Its armour may protect it from large predators, but it isn't particularly good defence against small prey. One extraordinary African insect hunter has no such trouble. It's a pangolin. Those horny scales, like the hedgehog's prickles, are made from modified hair. Its front paws are so big that they're useless for walking. Instead, it trundles along on its hind legs, balancing its torso with its tail. Its front paws are reserved for digging up ants. As it does so, it swallows stones. They accumulate in its muscular stomach and help to grind up the ants. But these small underground ant colonies are mere snacks. This is a real meal, a full-sized ant's nest. There are a million or so of them in here. The pangolin smashes through the nest wall with formidable power. Only an adult has the strength to do this. So young ones have to stay with their mother, feeding in her wake until they're big enough to dig for themselves. swarm all over their attacker, but the pangolin's armour is a very effective defence. Its eyes are protected by thick lids, and both its nostrils and its ears have special valves to keep the biting insects out. For its size, the pangolin has the longest tongue of any mammal, and the stickiest saliva. But mammals didn't always have ant colonies to feed on. The rise of social insects 60 million years after the first mammals was a landmark in evolution. It was then that termites and ants started to build huge nests, each containing millions of individuals. Here was so much food that insect eaters could grow big. is the biggest of them all, the giant anteater. Its 
eyesight is very poor and it relies mostly on its sense of smell, which is very acute. But if I keep downwind of it, I may not disturb it too much. The truth of the matter is that ants and termites aren't very nutritious. So the giant anteater has to do all it can to conserve energy. And one way of doing that is to sleep for 15 out of 24 hours. It covers itself too with that big bushy tail to reduce heat loss to a minimum. And it also keeps its body at as low a temperature as any mammal, 32 degrees. That means, of course, that its brain doesn't work very fast. So it's not an animal with lightning reactions or a dazzling intelligence. But then you don't really need that if you're an anteater. And now I think I'll get out of its way. Termite mounds are more numerous here than anywhere. But the challenges facing a termite eater are nonetheless considerable. Anteaters and pangolins have different ancestors, but the demands of their diet have shaped them in similar ways. Both have big claws. The giants are the largest, in fact, of any mammal. And both have an immensely long tongue that slips through the tube formed by the toothless jaws, so that both can virtually drink termites. a few hundred termites on that brief visit. As soon as it breaks into a mound, the inhabitants attack it so ferociously that they drive it away. But quick sampling like this does have an advantage. The termites will soon replace the ones they've lost, so in effect the anteater is harvesting the termite hills in its territory in a way that ensures a continuous supply. It may not have a dazzling intelligence, but nothing exploits termites more effectively than the giant anteater. If you wanted to explore the origins of this extraordinary animal, you'd have to go to a very surprising place. I'm near Messel in Germany. Behind me is a quarry rich in the fossilised remains of animals that died 50 million years ago. And that was a pivotal time in the history of the mammals. Even though these animals lived a very long time ago, some of them look remarkably familiar. This is a tree anteater very like the Tamandua anteater that lives in South America today. All the insect collecting equipment is there. Huge claws on the front legs. No teeth and jaws fused into a tube through which a long tongue would have flicked. And alongside the anteater, the first known pangolin. Once more, it has huge claws, no teeth, and again it looks identical with its living equivalent, 
the African pangolin of today. But why should these animals have remained unchanged for 50 million years? Well, the rocks and metal provide an answer to that too. From them have come a termite. More importantly, the queen of a termite colony. And it's the same in every important respect as its living relatives. And this is the key. If termites haven't changed for 50 million years, why change the design of the perfect termite eater? Even back then, the majority of insects were airborne and out of reach of ground-dwelling mammals. But one mammal followed the insects into the air, and fossils of it have also been found in the mussel deposits. It's a bat. Flight and the ability to catch insects on the wing is an extraordinary achievement. How do the bats do it? This is a great place for bats. There are a lot of insects flying around. At the moment, birds are feeding on them, and bats are asleep in their roosts. But soon, it'll get dark, and then the birds will go to roost, and the bats will come out to claim their share. There are even more flying insects than there were during the day. And down by the mill stream, there's a colony of Dorbenton's bats that are already stirring. Their little faces are so like a shrew's that it's easy to imagine the shrew-like ancestors in the trees jumping from branch to branch, chasing insects. Ever larger flaps of skin between their fingers help to extend those jumps until eventually they could fly. And how they can fly. The change from a scurrying animal like a shrew to a fluttering bat is surely the most natural in the whole history. mastery of flight is so complete that few insects can outmaneuver them in the air. The bat scoops up the moth with the membrane around its tail and then passes it forward to the mouth. Their ground living ancestors probably used sound to find their way through the nighttime forests as the shrews still do. But bats then perfected that technique using sound frequencies beyond our hearing. A bat detector makes those calls audible to us. Bats emit high intensity pulses of sound and then listen to the echoes that bounce back. Their brains then process these reflections to give them a three dimensional image of their surroundings and their prey. Boys flight are relatively easy to catch. But then some evolved a defense, a simple ear, so that when they hear the sonar of the bats approaching, they can swerve out of the way. 